Hello everyone and welcome to Driver's Therapy. Today we're going to be looking at the AC L1 Composite Vehicle Type 4 and we're going to be reviewing this booklet. So what we did is we printed out about half of it. We're not going to be doing the wiring diagrams and we're not going to be talking about the transmission solenoid chart. We're going to leave those for separate videos and we'll talk about that at the end of the video. So let's go ahead and dive in. What you guys are going to be doing is you're going to follow along with our whiteboard, but I'm also going to be overlaying this on the video so you guys could follow along. So I'm going to be going over the stuff I think you should know. And I did take the test five times and there's a couple of things I think you guys should really, really get down. And I'm just going to help you guys get a better understanding of the composite vehicle type four. All right, let's get started. Okay, so it shows page four, and we're gonna be starting off with the powertrain. So it says it's a generic four-stroke V6 engine. Well, that's pretty generic, right? So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do V6, right? I could write, and then four-stroke. Now you guys are probably thinking, well, what, what other stroke would there be? Well, imagine if they put a rotary engine in there, right? But we know for a fact that it's a V6 four-stroke. That looks like a nine, but it's a four. All right, so pretty pretty simple stuff. Now they're gonna be talking about equipped with a four chain driven overhead camshaft, 24 valves, hydraulic valve, valve lifters, variable intake camshaft timing, and variable intake valve lift. Now some of the things I think you should really take note is the hydraulic valve lifters, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. The chain driven, not so much, but you never wanna get caught with the question that talks about a timing belt when it's chain driven. So those are those small details you don't wanna get caught on the test, but unlikely, I don't, I don't see that being there, but uh, you never know, right? All right, so transmission, six speed automatic transaxle with overdrive, and it's controlled by the transmission control module, the TCM. Now I think you guys should get very familiar with the word TCM because you're gonna see in the composite book, a wiring diagram in the back, but you're also most likely gonna see those questions in the test. I see them in a lot of the practice tests and the motor age and the Del Mar, but just getting well acquainted with the TCM is pretty good. Knowing how it's interconnected with the ECM, knowing where it gets its power, where it gets its ground, just getting familiar with the wiring diagram and how it works is pretty good. All right, now it's gonna talk about six forward gears and one reverse gear, but like I said, we're gonna save the transmission solenoid chart for later. All right, moving on to the ECM. Well, the ECM is uh, the heart, uh, the intelligence heart, or the brain, there we go, that's a better way, the brain of the car. And one of the main things you really need to get uh, familiar with is the wiring diagram of the ECM. Now, let me go ahead and tell you right away that a couple of things you should know about the ECM is that it contains a 120 ohm terminating resistor and data bus, and that a lot of things take their command from the ECM as you would uh, assume. Now, when it comes to the composite book, just read this stuff. This is some of the stuff you're really gonna have to understand, but it's a really overall generic information in my opinion, but you still wanna know it, like controls the vehicle's charging system. You know, that's, you know, it's telling you what systems it's in charge of, but again, we have a lot to cover and I'm just gonna go over the stuff I really think you guys should be focusing on. And this is just an opinion, of course. I can't tell you what's on the test, right? Okay. Fuel pump, fuel pump, fuel pump control module. Let me tell you guys, you really, really didn't know this. Now, the reason why I was lucky about knowing how the fuel pump control module works is because this is real familiar to the way that a Toyota one works. See, on a Toyota Supra that I had, it had it kind of like, I'm mean, using a variable, right? A variable fuel control pump ECM, meaning that it, it put about 75% of the voltage on low throttle and that a higher throttle gave 100% voltage and it made the fuel pump run stronger and blah, blah, blah. And this is kind of similar. It's got like a, a system like that. So it communicates with the ECM. The ECM provides a five volt enabled signal to the fuel pump control module to enable the fuel pump operation. So I want you guys to think about it like in the military. I'm a vet, I know some of you guys are vets out there and if you're not, it's okay. But what I'm about to say is 
who's in charge? It said that the ECM is in charge. The ECM provides a full five, full, a five volt enabled signal to the fuel pump. So if the ECM wasn't able to get that five volt signal to the fuel pump, what would happen guys, right? The, the fuel pump control module could be good. The fuel pump could be good. But if you're missing that, that five volt signal wire from the ECM, what would happen, right? So it's good for you to know that it's getting its orders from the ECM. So that's a good thing. All right, fuel pump control module changes the volume of fuel supplied by the fuel by varying a duty cycle of voltage supplied to the fuel pump. Now going back to my little story about the fuel pump control module on my Supra, it was the same thing. I thought it was pretty cool because, you know, you are saving a little bit of gas. You're not putting a lot of wear and tear on the fuel pump and there is a variable duty cycle, which I think is really cool. So just knowing that if you guys are Honda fans, it's like kind of like a VTEC system. Like it's not going to give it full power unless you're asking for full power, which is pretty cool. Now it starts getting, the composite book starts getting into some more nitty gritty stuff, which you guys should know. You should read this front to back. You know, it talks about uh, the, the percentage of duty cycle and blah, blah, blah. But again, going back to the wiring diagram for the fuel pump, you guys are really gonna have to understand it. And let me tell you, this is probably one of the most common questions I saw on a practice test as far as motor age in Del Mar. And it pretty much any online practice test I saw, there was always a question about the wiring diagram, if, if one of the grounds missing, if it's not turning on. Let me tell you, it's a simple system, but you really need to know it. So, you know, go to the back of the booklet, start looking at that wiring diagram and start getting familiar with how it works. All right, TCM module. Well, we talked about that in the beginning. We talked about how it controls the transmission, how it's really important. So essentially the transmission has its own brain and that's gonna be the TCM. Now, this is an important thing, provides its own regulated five volt supply. It's really good for you to know especially going back to the wiring diagrams of the TCM or just trying to find any, any issues with the TCM. You wanna know where it gets its power, you wanna know where it gets its ground, you wanna know where the switches are associated, how they come on, how they come off. So this is one thing you guys gotta know. Are you ready? When in fail safe mode, the TCM commands maximum line pressure and turns off all transmission solenoids. The transmission then defaults to fifth gear and the torque converter clutch will be disabled. So you guys gotta get that in your head. Fifth gear and torque converter clutch will be disabled. All right, instrument cluster. All right, the instrument cluster is a little bit more integrated in this composite vehicle. So you guys gotta actually take consideration of it. And the reason why is in the ECM, we had a 120 ohm terminating resistor in the data bus. And guess what? We have one in the instrument cluster module. So we have two of them. We have one in the ECM and one in the instrument cluster module. If you guys were in front of me, I would make you guys repeat that because that is mandatory for you to know. These terminating resistors are gonna come up in all your practice tests. Like I said, I can't tell you what's gonna be on the AAC test or what questions I saw, but let me tell you, this is something really good to know. So again, where are the terminating resistors? Okay, I'm making sure you guys know. All right, this includes a malfunction indicator lamp or your engine light, right? That's how we call it, and a mobile laser indicator. Good to know. There's a lot more little information in this paragraph that you guys need to know, but like I said, I'm just hitting the stuff I want you guys to know. All right. Electronic throttle control systems. Oh my gosh. You know, it's like one of those times that I want to tell you something and like I can't tell you something because it's like I don't want to get in trouble. But again, you got to know this because you have a lot of stuff going on. You have APP, which is your dual accelerate pedal positions or APP stands for accelerate position position. But within those accelerator position switches or whatever pedal position switches, you have to know what happens when there's a fault. And it's not that complicated. Uh, essentially, if you have, let's say, if both APP sensors or both TP sensors fail or a correlation error, error occurs, the ECM will turn on the mill and disable the electronic throttle control. So even in the booklet, it's telling you exactly what happens. And let me tell you, you got to know the difference between 15% and 35% throttle. And what I mean by that is like, you actually have to read this and know what happens if one APP sensor goes out. What happens if both go out, right? So instead of me just asking you, let's see if I can get that information for you right here. All right. So 
It says, if one APP sensor or one TP sensor fails, the ECM will turn on the malfunction indicator lamp and limit the maximum throttle opening to 35%. So one APP or one TP equals 35, right? When I hear the word TP, I think of toilet paper, I'm sorry. All right, so then you have to find out what happens if both of them go out. Well, if all of them, both of them go out, they will disable the electronic throttle control. And there's more information here and you have to know how that stuff works and on top of that, you actually have to know how it's wired. You have to go back to its wiring diagram. And that's why it's gonna be a whole separate video because like reading about it and knowing how it works, but then looking at the wiring diagram blends it all together. All right, so now we're gonna talk about, so no idle relearn procedures required after a component replacement or loss of voltage to the ECM. Let me repeat that again. No idle relearn procedure is required after component replacement or loss of voltage of ECM. All right, I'm sure you guys got it now. All right, moving on. Okay, fuel delivery system is sequential multi-port fuel injection, SFI. You guys gotta make sure it's not direct port injection, right? Or something like that. You gotta know what fuel system you're working on. And then this is important. Again, I wish I could make you guys repeat this. Returnless fuel supply with electronic fuel pump assembly mounted inside the fuel pump. Don't get tricked. Don't tell, don't get tricked by like, though you gotta, the fuel pump is out of the fuel tank. It's in the bottom, whatever. So it's a returnless system with the fuel pump assembly inside the tank. All right. All right. Here's another thing. Fuel pressure regulator attached to the fuel pump assembly to control fuel pressure. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm used to seeing a fuel pressure regulator on a fuel rail, right? That's kind of really common. But on a composite vehicle, it's in the fuel pump. And where's the fuel pump at, guys? In the fuel tank assembly. All right, I think you guys are tracking now. Okay, so this is good information for you guys to know. Make a note card. Key on, engine off, fuel pressure is 58 to 62 PSI. And then they got in KPAs. You guys could do all that conversion. Also, fuel system pressure should be between 58 to 62 PSI during all conditions. So this is pretty good because you guys should know that with the key on or the key off or at all conditions, what should the fuel pressure be? It should be 68 to 62 PSI. All right, we're moving on. This might be another two, this might be two videos or we're just gonna have to start going through this a little quicker because this is, this is a definitely a big, big one. All right, firing order. Guess what the firing order is, guys. Are you ready? It's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you very much, AC. We appreciate that. All right, crankshaft position sensor input is used for base timing calculations. That is a very important thing. If you guys haven't worked with a crank position sensor diagnostics or troubleshooting or replacement let me tell you it is one of the most valuable things you will do i had to literally test troubleshoot and replace a crankshaft position sensor on one of my cars and it really helped out a lot when i took the test because i knew exactly what was going on because i was trying to troubleshoot an issue so the ckp sensor is a very important question question very important sensor if it doesn't work the car is not going to start because it really lets the ecm it really lets a lot of things know the timing and and lets it know pretty much if a watch is running perfectly and all those gears are working perfectly if you remove the gear it wouldn't run it's the same thing without the crankshaft position sensor it ain't working you really gotta understand how it works now it's used for base ignition timing so you know that that's our base timing calculation you know that's important we'll come back to that all right immobilizer immobilizer anti-theft system all right now I might trip on my words, but you guys, you guys understand, right? You guys are understanding. I'm not perfect. All right. Mobilizer anti-theft system. Here we go. So you up to eight keys can be registered. That's good for you to know. Each key has its unique internal code. And if one valid key is available, or if all keys have been lost, the scan tool must be used to delete lost keys and register new keys. Good thing to know. And it needs the VIN and data stuff and all that. Make sure you read all this. The immobilizer control module does not require a key ID learn if battery voltage is lost. Remember that. All right, moving on. Again, I'm skipping a lot of stuff, but you've got to read this whole thing. I'm just kind of working with you. This is going to help you out no matter what. All right, so fuel injectors are, are located in the intake manifold ports near the intake valves. Fuel injectors are ground sided control. Good stuff to know. All right, this is a fun one for you guys to know. Clear flood mode. During cranking, if you have the accelerator 80% or higher, it's gonna disable the fuel injectors. So that's just kind of like one of those clear flood modes. It's good to know. 
it's also a good idea to know just in general for cars that you know as you guys are master techs and you guys are technicians all right so run modes open and closed loop fuel cut off i'm not going to read all this but you have to know what is open loop and closed loop now i was going to give you kind of the way i learned it but you have to figure out a good way for you guys to memorize this um essentially I remember closed loop was, I was just thinking when the ECM receives valid air fuel ratio signals and the throttle is open less than 80%. Um, like I said, I have my own way of memorizing this, but you've got to look at this and you've got to remember a good way to remember open loop and closed loop because it's important because it's two states, states and status of the car that it's going to use different signals to take its information. So open loop, the ECM does not use the air fuel ratio sensor signals. Instead, it will calculate the fuel injector pulse with based on the math and engine temperature, which really isn't the correct way to do it, you know, the, but it's going through a warm up process and everything. So closed loop is when it actually takes more direct measurements from the air fuel ratio system from signals. All right, absolute load, normal absolute load is watt at 95%. If you guys don't know what watt is, it's wide, wide open throttle. All right, now a lot of this stuff, oh, I didn't highlight anything for variable valve lift control. And let me tell you how important this is, guys. You wanna know why I didn't write anything here? Because this is my instructions for you. Are you ready? You need to read all of this. You probably need to write it all down and take notes. And then you need to look at the wiring diagram and the schematics. You need to compare this to that and make your own conclusion. This is a beast. I don't even want, it. this would be a whole video. So again, if you guys, like I said, guys, um, you know, this is time, this is effort. You guys support me, I'll support you. You guys help me out, you know, we could probably get one of these videos out, but this is a beast. All right, uh, accelerator pedal positions. Again, these are going into more in depth about the voltage of whatever position they are. So everything we talked about, if they go bad or if they're disabled, now we're talking about ranges of the APP sensors. Here's a quick information for you. The two APP sensors don't have exact same voltage readings. Like one is 0.5 to 3.5 and the other one's 1 1.5 to 4.5. So some stuff you really need to know. Now I know by now, if you guys haven't taken the L1, you're like, what in the world? It is manageable, dude, but this is a serious test, like a serious one. You cannot mess around with this, all right? So we're gonna keep going on. All right, so air fuel ratios are their own beast. If you don't know how an air fuel ratio works, you really need to get down to the physics and chemistry of it, or I don't need, the science of it. And that's pretty much know your lambada, know your ambient temperatures, know your, your uh, atmospheric pressures, uh, sea levels and all that. You really need to know all this. Again, this is a whole different video, but you know, this is one that I recommend that you watch other videos. I'm gonna plug a video in the description for this one that I watched over and over to get a better understanding of this. All right, camshaft position sensors are hall effect sensors. You're gonna really have to dive deep into hall effect sensors, so just know that. Crankshaft position sensors is a 35 pulse for each crankshaft revolution. You want to know their signals, how they look, their uh, voltage. And here's a great fact you guys need to know. A CKP sensor produces AC voltage, right? So you guys need to know that right away. That's like one of the most important things. So don't get caught up and think this is a DC direct current. Your CKP signal is a five volts uh, AC center, right? And you need to know how it works and you need to know about the reluctor wheel and all that. And you really need to dive into this. So the L1 is really for people who've been working and advanced stuff or not advanced stuff, but have been working for a while. So hopefully I'm talking to you guys and you're like, oh yeah, I know a crankshaft position sensor. If you don't, you probably need to go back and uh, read about it, go, go into your shop, work on it, or ask somebody to let you have that job so you can learn more about it. But again, I'm gonna talk about some of the stuff you guys need to know no, but I'm really expecting you guys to actually understand this instead of, you know, starting from ground up because this is an advanced test, right? Okay, EGR valve position sensor. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, right now, this is important, but you really need to know what an EGR does. Like, what, is it, what does it do? You know, does it lower temperatures? What does it prevent? Does it pre prevent detonation? You know, this is the type of stuff you guys need to understand. Fuel level sensors, just know, you know, just know the voltage. You know, if you have low fuel or high fuel, you know, what kind of voltage that is. 
fuel pressure sensor, we talked fuel tank evap pressure sensor. You know what you need to know about evap as well? What happens if you turn on evap at idle? Like what does it do? What happens if you turn the EGR on idle, right? Well, if you turn the EGR on idle when it's not supposed to be on idle, it's gonna have rough idle. Sometimes it might even, engine might even stop. Well, the EVAP, what does the EVAP do to the fuel trims? Does it increase the fuel trims? Does it decrease the fuel trims? It would decrease them because EVAP has got a lot of that, that fuel in there, so it would make it a rich condition. So once you start understanding all of this, you're gonna really get it down because it's all interconnected, but it's hard, but it's not. <laughs> all right, knock sensors. Just know how they're wired, right? They're quite, a little, quite, quite complicated. The same thing with like the heater sensors. They got a bunch of stuff going on there. So you guys got to know how that works. All right, we're moving along. All right, heated oxygen sensors. They're electrically heated, heated zirconia sensors. I can't pronounce that. All right, sensor output varies from 0.0, .0 to one volts. Believe it or not, the oxygen sensor is some of the easiest things to understand because high voltage means what? A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of oxygen. Low voltage means not a lot of oxygen, so rich. And then you really gotta understand, you know, the resistance, what happens if they're working, what happens if they're not. They're a great diagnostic tool, but you really under need to understand how they work as far as the schematics, you know, you got to know the power side, ground side, what happens if you do voltage drop across it? Will you get kind of caught up? Should there be a voltage drop? I'm going to leave that for you guys to research because like you guys really got to push hard for this test. All right, map pressure. The map, this is probably the thing that blew my mind. You have to know, you know, there's like all kinds of inverse, like the math versus the map. If the math map is low and the math is high or if the math is high and map is low, you pretty much have to understand that. This is one of the great diagnostic tools too. Like if you have a high uh, map reading, you know, what's going on is, you know, or do you have a, a vacuum leak or do you have a, you know, is there the timing's off or is there something wrong with the restricted exhaust? So you guys really need to understand what's going on with that. So um, hot wire design for the MAF sensor. Like I said, you guys need to learn that. Throttle position sensors are kind of like the APP sensors where you got to know the different voltages, what happens if one fails, what happens if the other one doesn't fail, and uh, going from there. All right, so we got temperature sensors. I think the most important thing you guys got to know is if you have a little bit of dyslexia like me, negative temperature coefficient, you really got to understand that because it's really trippy. It's like when it heats up, the resistance goes down or resistance goes up when it heats up or it blah, blah, blah. So you need to make sure that you know what's going on. So right here it says at 212 Fahrenheit, the sensor is reading 0 0.46. So that's telling you that the voltage you know, the voltage is low, right? So what happens to the resistance? Know your negative temperature coefficient because you're also going to have one in the AT sensor or the IAT sensor, right? Also right here, we got uh, another one in the transmission fluid temperature sensor. So you guys should really know how a negative temperature coefficient sensor works or, or you know, or sensor. You guys got to know that. All right, transmission stuff. Like I said, separate video, but you know, because that, that chart is, is, is crazy. Look at that guys, we are moving along, but we still got some stuff here. All right, we have actuators. You know, actuators is one of those things you just have to read and know. And when you're taking the test, I will tell you this. You're gonna be you're gonna be going through this digitally like crazy. You're gonna be scrolling. Luckily, when you get to these actuators, you know, one of the main things you're gonna be looking at is the resistance specifications. You know, know, know your coil primary resistance specification. Know the coil secondary resistance specification. Know it by heart by then, or know where it's at in the booklet. So one of the great things you wanna do is if you get familiar with it, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time when you're taking the test because you could just scroll to the area where you know where it's at, right? So, and of course, start relay, coal resistance, when energized, provides battery voltage, B plus to start solenoid, blah, blah, blah. Like I said, one of the best things knowing is if you go over this and you read it, then you guys will be able to navigate through it. All right. So this is what we're going to be making a separate video about this chart. If for you guys, you smart guys out there, if you understand it, awesome. If you guys are having trouble understanding it, we're probably going to put a video together so you guys can understand that. And that video is also going to be in our channel. We're not going to charge for that because we're just going to do that for you guys. All right. I know that it's like, I feel like a salesman right now. You know, we'll, we'll throw in a free oil change, but no, that's, that's just, I know you guys are going to need help with that. So we'll hook you up with that. All right. Going back to the fuel pump control module and all this stuff. We talked about it. You really need to just understand all the things that go to that and then we're coming to system monitors now this is one of the parts that really got me to be honest with you, even now 
you really have to understand this emission stuff. You have to know all the criteria to run a monitor. You have to know the stuff that could fill a monitor. And you have to know what happens uh, in the scan data or in the scan tool when it tells you certain things like monitor did not pass, monitor did not run, monitor did incomplete. So you need to kind of know all that. Um, but like I said, when you start navigating through all the emission stuff, it's going to make sense. Monitor is its own beast. I'm not going to just harp on it because it's like I'm not that good at it. So don't, you don't want to learn from me on that one. But again, um, fuel fuel system, very self-explanatory. You got to read it. Don't, don't skip it. Don't read it. I mean, do read it. Freeze frame data. I mean, it talks about it here, but in a lot of the practice tests I saw, and when you're studying, you're gonna see freeze, freeze frame data. And that's when you have like all the information where it says the map, the math, the timing, the fuel trims and all that. You wanna be an expert at reading all that because the crazy thing is, is that you're doing kind of detective work. You're troubleshooting, diagnosing. And when you understand how all those little blocks, all the information there, how it all correlates, when you find something that's wrong, you could usually double check it because some, another sensor will support that information and be like, all right, I, I know that something's wrong because both these sensors are supporting each other's data and it could help you come to a faster conclusion when you're diagnosing stuff. So it's a really good thing. And then your drive cycles and stuff like that. It's all that, there's this memorization. You got to really memorize it, read it, or know where it's at when you're taking the test. And then same thing with trips and clearing and scan tools and all that. All right, guys, we did it. We kind of rushed through it. And the reason why is this is a beast. I want to keep you guys' attention. Like I said, we're going to be providing the transmission chart for free, but in our driver's therapy website, we're going to be offering the course. It might not be up right away because I got to make it, but we're going to be offering the course for the actual schematics for the booklet. And the reason why is that's going to be a beast. We have to go to Office Depot and we're going to have to print out an actual schematic and I'm going to have to go through them and stuff like that. It's going to be a lot of work. And you know, when you guys buy those uh, courses for seven bucks and you guys have messaged me and you, it's helped you out a lot, but seven bucks, I mean, that's like a latte, frate, bate, whatever they call it, coffee. You know, that's like if I go out there and help you out and you guys pass, you guys buy me a coffee or a beer or whatever, a burrito, right? You know, I'm, I like burritos, right? I'm brown. <laughs> but anyways, you know, it's a way to say thank you. So don't be afraid to buy a course. I mean, it can only help you out. Trust me, we do good good work. So we're going to put that course out there. And if you guys need any other courses, check out our website. We're, we're doing pretty good, putting out some good courses. All right, guys, thanks for watching. You take care. Best of luck for your test. Uh, I really mean that. I, I'm here for you guys. If you need any help, email us. I'll put the email in the description. You guys take care and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.